the uh, festivities last night, and thanks to our panelists. I was, uh, we're here to talk about the single most important issue in Silicon Valley right now, uh, and maybe in the country. Uh, I wanted to start off, if you would permit me, with just some, um, some stats, some data. So um, a National Foundation for, America policy, for American Policy study found that of uh, 87 unicorns, over half were founded by people from outside the US, and 71% had executives uh, who were immigrants. Uh, in 2011, a survey of Fortune 500 companies found that 40% had been founded by immigrants or the children of immigrants, second-generation Americans. Um, and the Pew, a Pew study that came out yesterday reconfirmed what a lot of people already know intuitively, that the United States is the country with the most immigrants in the, in the world, and that our share of immigrants um, in the 1970s was about 4.7%, and today it stands at 13, over 13, almost 14%, which is pretty much the, you know, the same time period in which the technology industry really took off and has created in, uh, you know, insane amounts of wealth and value in the United States. So that's sort of the background. Um, there are a lot of numbers uh, in this field. There's a lot of data. But the first question I wanted to ask you guys was to tell us a little bit about your own story, the stuff that you don't see in numbers about how you know, immigration uh, has affected your life and, and brought you to the, where you are. So Teresa, could we start with you? Yeah. Sorry. Um, <coughs> so, um, so I am an immigrant. I came to the United States from uh, Jakarta, Indonesia when I was four years old. Uh, my family is ethnic Chinese, and they were, uh, there, was a, there was a revolution going on where ethnic Chinese were being targeted in the 60s. So my parents um, got us on a list. There used to be a, um, and they, it still exists. It's only a few thousand now. Uh, in the 60s and into the early 70s, they had special visas for people with certain skills. Uh, in particular, at that time, they needed um, scientists, but also medical physicians, and that's how we came here. Uh, and my name, uh, which is how this came up, you guys were asking me, uh, Aiden was indeed <laughs> correct. It is a Dutch spelling with the I in it, and that is because Indonesia was a Dutch colony, and my parents wanted to give me an American name in hopes that we would clear the immigration list, and we did, but they gave me a Dutch name, uh, which we've now anglicized. <laughs> Just pretend there's no I. All right. A Matt? Yeah, I'm an immigrant as well. I was born in Krakow, Poland. Uh, my parents moved to Germany when I was four years old. While we were in Germany, my parents actually applied for immigration status to five different countries. So we tried to get into the UK, we tried to get into Canada, we tried to get into the US, Australia, and New Zealand. Eventually, Canada came through to us, mm. and we moved in 1991, uh, and now I split my time between Vancouver, Canada, and the US. Right. Uh, my name is Aydin Senkudin. Uh, I was originally born in uh, Istanbul, Turkey. I came to the U.S. for college. Uh, I went through the H-1B process, uh, which took twice as long because I had to change companies in the middle of uh, applying for it, from Silicon Graphics to Google. Um, and uh, then after that, I got my green card, and now I'm a naturalized American citizen. But I also lived and worked in places like Germany, Switzerland, and Brazil, speak five languages, and you know, familiar with a few others. That's why the Dutch comment. But I kind of feel most of him in Silicon Valley, where I am not judged by my accent, where I'm from, um, you know, my, any of other preferences, but just ideas. And I feel it truly is the place where one can truly maximize their potential. Um, so it's a special privilege to have gone through that process, have gone through all the pains, like fear of deportation, yeah. and, uh, which I experienced, and almost not getting into Google because Sergey is like, why are we waiting for your H-1B? Why can't you marry an American girl? These are all real stories, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but that's why I'm passionate in here. OK, great. So uh, you know, the first question I want to ask is, of course, the, the gloomiest question. But how, how panicked should uh, people in the Valley be about the climate that we are, are, are in? Have things? decidedly turned for the worst uh, with the current administration? Or how, how do you handle that? So I'm going to start with this. So for those of you who already stuck hearing me before, interestingly, I was on a cybersecurity panel. Mm -hmm. A bunch of those guys are in various different uh, policy and administration discussions. And what I thought was concerning uh, is that 
it is true that they are all off the record, so you can't guess which person told me this, um, uh. <laughs> that indeed the H-1B visa, which is, it's, again, it's only 65,000 visas, of, of which, you know, there are, there are 10 million sort of non-permanent uh, uh, visas that are issued, 8 million are for visitors, but so 2 million for other purposes, 65,000. So just to set the context, right, back to numbers, Matt. Mm. Anyway, but with that, <clears throat> there is a feeling, you know, there's been a lot of talk about it. It's definitely going to be impacted because it is, at, even at those numbers, it's a priority of the current administration to have that impact be felt in Silicon Valley. So I don't think panic is the right word, but I think if you feel like it's gonna change and it's gonna impact your business, there are changes that are going to happen. Uh, the, they've been talking mostly about the fact that making sure that the dollars that you spend on an employee are the same as for your other employees in that location. Mm. Um, and so I think some combination of economic change is going to happen and certainly won't be getting more of them. Uh, there's also a possibility we'll be getting fewer of them. Um, but I think panic is the wrong word. It's just planning for likely reality. Mm -hmm. I think maybe the reason why you're using words like panic and gloomy is that, especially in Silicon Valley in California, it impacts us kind of disproportionately. I mean, I think all of us probably see what's going on now, and like my first reaction is, oh my God, like if I was going through what I went through 10 years later, I might not have been there, like have not had my family, this job, and so like it really freaks you out. So I think it really impacted morale. And just to give you an anecdote, I have seen a record number of people and friends uh, apply or in the process of getting a second citizenship yeah. in a variety of different places, and it blows my mind because this is the country that is most welcoming where these people have made amazing lives and seeing this reaction I think is a bit scary. On the other hand, my other reaction is we also can't look at US as only where we live and I do think that there are parts of the country that is very disenfranchised and illusion and it's almost like we live in two separate countries. Yeah. Like we don't really, really know what they're going through and understand them and I think they kind of look at us probably as like overly liberal and different people too. So I feel like bridging that gap is much more important so that immigration doesn't become this scapegoat because I think it's really split into multiple issues and that's why kind of we are where we are today. Yeah, I wanna dig into that a little bit later, but uh, wh what do you think? I mean, the, one of the big differences from a decade ago obviously is that there are a lot more Startup, hu startup hubs around the world. There are a lot more places where, where you can go um, to start your company or to grow your company. You are in Canada and uh, maybe yeah. the beneficiary of some of the uncertainty that this administration has brought to this. Yeah. How, I think what's I, your perspective? Yeah, I think all the rhetoric and fear mongering is very unhelpful. Um, personally, I'm not panicking though. There's enough checks and balances in the system to avoid some of the extreme cases. Um, coming down from the current administration. That being said, I think we're on the wrong side of the trend. In Singapore, you can get a work permit in one week. You literally get text message on your phone seven yeah. days after applying, and you can move, start a job, and start paying taxes. Yeah. By June of this year in Canada, you'll be able to get a work permit in just two weeks. Yeah. Even France has, very, has had very forward-looking um, immigration policies for skilled immigrants. UK is following in a similar suit, so anytime you're going against the trend, that's not a very positive sign. The, ta the competition for talent and STEM workers is only going to intensify. Many countries view having those types of people as a glo global advantage to their economy. Mm -hmm. Obviously, going back to stats, immigrants are twice as likely to start companies as uh, naturally born citizens in the US. Virtually all job employment growth um, over the last couple of decades has happened from, big, from small businesses, not from the Fortune 1000, the Global yeah. 1000 yeah. type companies. Um, so I think we're definitely on the wrong side of the trend. Right. I'm hopeful things will turn around. If, if um, the impact of what's been happening in, in Washington is more of a sort of chilling effect or a kind of environmental effect rather than uh, affecting individuals, what, what are the sort of effective short-term strategies for companies? What are you guys telling portfolio companies? Maybe I just want to expand one minute on what Matt said. Also, we have to remember that a lot of countries are trying to emulate US, especially Silicon Valley. That's why I think those comments are really prescient. And the top five most valuable companies in the world right now, three of them are in Silicon Valley, two of them are in Washington. And they're all technology related. So everybody's trying to 
take our secret formula, and when you look at it, uh, because the kind of people that are needed are not in enough supply here, there was a Wall Street Journal stats of how few computer science and engineering alumni we have, so immigration actually has been a crucial factor of that huge success. And so the change is gonna happen, I feel like Matt said, we are on the wrong side of it, and we should engage uh, part of that positive activity, I think, to help the rest of the country that is disenfranchised, and we need to somehow uh, teach them the skills, um, educate them. I think there's a big gap, like it's another interesting stat. The company that probably provides the most jobs in the US, or one of the ones, is Walmart. Um, they spend hundreds of millions, maybe close to a billion dollars, because surprisingly for jobs like store managers and other stuff that normal regular people get, there is no training. And so, uh, and meanwhile, we own the Silicon Valley back companies that are very heavy on computer science and engineering, and it's crazy where 70% of uh, college demand and jobs in those uh, areas, and yet only three to 5% of college alumni are computer science and engineering specialists. So mm. I kind of see a big gap in education, which, is, which to me is the much bigger issue than immigration, and immigration is being scapegoated also for security, like I don't think we can put immigration and security together, like border security and who do you allow through the borders, I think should be disconnected from immigration issue itself. Mm -hmm. What are you telling companies when they come to you and say, we have a set of immediate problems, yeah. you know, that we are, are challenged with? Yeah, you know, so I think it's interesting because Matt said that he's uh, in Vancouver as well as in SF. So we have had companies in the past, and I think this is going to increase in terms of if we can't get enough developers, when we have a company where they're in Mountain View, but they're also in Vancouver, right. where they can get where they can get not only you know native-born Canadians, but they can much more easily get people who are computer scientists or engineers that are trained and living elsewhere to work in their facility in Canada much more quickly than they can get an H-1B in the United States. Honestly, I think most of our like, you know, venture-funded little startups, I mean, it's, it's a super high bar for yeah. them to even try to get an H-1B for people right. because uh, they know that there are so few. And, and in fact, what I am starting to see in terms of the chilling effect is I think that there are, there are, I know there are great entrepreneurs, and I might have been this person that, you know, mm -hmm. at large companies that won't, that were executives that were trying to recruit either into our companies or who want to start a company, and they literally come and talk to me, they're like, I have this great idea, this is really mm -hmm. what I want to do, but I need to stay here for another 12, 12 well, however long until, mm -hmm. because I'm on this H-1B, and I don't know, you know, I'm applying mm -hmm. to get a more permanent, but I, until then, I'm, I'm stuck with my employer. I think maybe one interesting perspective where the press can help, I think we only look at the most dramatic uh, kind of uh, crisis-oriented aspects of this, but uh, so we back, you know, a little over 200 companies, and all the ones that are in Silicon Valley in the U.S., the founders, they're either first or second generation immigrants, majority of them, and they hail from 40 different backgrounds. And to Matt and Teresa's point, we have companies where there is a small US office or Silicon Valley office, but engineering is in Germany, places like Bulgaria, we have an Australian company with a US office, customer services in the Philippines. I don't even know that people realize that the definition of company has changed so drastically. Even Apple, like all their manufacturing, a lot of it is in Taiwan, and you know, customer service centers are probably in Ireland, like along with tax and accounting. What we used to think of like a company with headquarters in one city, <clears throat> and majority and all employees in one city has drastically changed and it is continuing to change. And so part of it is really kind of catching up to times. Mm -hmm. um, and it is the reality. I don't think it's gonna change whether we change our policy or not. These companies are gonna adapt and like as a result, like to Canada point, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and all these companies are now hiring a lot more engineers in Canada. Yeah. Um, and over time, it's not gonna happen next year or two years. But if a trend like that were to continue for like 10, 15 years, it could have a significant impact. Right. Yeah. Entrepreneurs are very creative and resilient. They'll yeah. find a <laughs> way around whatever yeah. uh, policies come down. Yeah. Um, but you know, it, it is um, disruptive yeah. to say the least. I mean, leaders in, in the Valley have been talking about H-1B for, for a long time <laughs> and immigration more generally. But why, why, hasn't, um, why have, hasn't that been heard? Uh, in Washington, do you think? What, what keeps uh, this sector from um, coalescing in a sort of impactful way? I mean, if, 
if the oil industry has a problem with something, they get heard, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, why, why do you think that is? I think there are two main reasons. Let's be very honest and let's look at the facts. Um, Silicon Valley and the people that are passionate about immigration probably is a tiny percentage of population, super disproportionate share of the wealth created. That's why I said five companies, most valuable, they probably represent like 0.001 percent of all uh, employment, but they represent five of the most valuable companies in the world. So there is this crazy like balance that's happening. I think the other thing is like um, areas like oil is still seen as strategic and has military aspects. Um, so there is probably a lot more of this, uh, but it comes down to votes, right? I mean, our government and politicians in Washington is based on votes, and I think that's what we need to get smarter about and affect the rest of the country, because unless this kind of tech tornado has also a positive impact on the rest of the country that is disillusioned, I'm not really sure how we're really going to be able to impact policy because the politicians are going to do what's best for the majority of the people, not minority, a tiny minority of the people, even though they represent a huge part of the value creation. I think we've been making that point. Um, it seems like we're not getting the results we need, so we, we need to add or change some of that strategy. Let, you know, let me... Let me, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. I didn't, I guess a couple of things. So one is, you're right, oil is seen as strategic. I think technology ought to be seen as strategic. Yes. And perhaps, like with oil, it's only when bad things happen That's right. uh, that people see it as a strategic asset. So is. interestingly, with all of the hacking, yeah. the, the nation state hacking, going back to Sony, right? Yeah. Yeah. And more recently with the election, hopefully, perhaps now, um, and supposedly there are, we don't know about them, but secret yeah. sort of like, counter cyber, you know, cyber offensive mm -hmm. activities that are going on. So like, let's, let's start seeing technology yep. as strategically advantage. Other point, you're right in terms of like, they're disproportionate in terms of market cap. Um, but you know, venture backed companies actually represent 11 million jobs today in the United yeah. States. That's one out of 10 private sector jobs. So I hear you like we're, and especially if what you do is you watch HBO Silicon Valley, it's like a bunch of like weird, super, you know, like mm -hmm. in a small little world. Yeah. But we do create real jobs, so I think we need to help. So my hope is that with this administration, which is on the one hand sort of anti-Valley, on the other hand very pro-business, yeah. those kinds of understanding yeah. national security and business and maybe putting that to the forefront. And then the last thing I would just say is I think all of us should not just talk about H-1B because that is very polarizing and, it's, and separating other types of national security is different than immigration, but so about five or 600,000 people every year have student visas. Mm -hmm. And if we, you know, there hasn't been as much of a push on that. And most of my entrepreneurs, like you did too. I was, I most people went, people. yeah, a lot of people, right? So forget about the H-1B issue. What yeah. about just trying to do something where I know that if you get a degree in certain fields, you get one year that you can work until you can find your H-1B. Well, why don't we make it something much five more long-term yeah. than that, right? Yeah. Uh, and also allow people to, start companies instead of just going to existing yeah. companies to, as proof of employment. Right, right. Actually, there's a very important point you made, which is we only look at the past or the current job distribution. And thank you for mentioning the 11 million number, but I think what is even most striking is how much more of a percentage of future jobs tech will represent, yeah, right? right? Yeah. You, we cannot build policy on what's happening today or what happened in the past. We need to do smart policy of what's gonna happen in the future. That's why all those other countries have seen that there is like this crazy shift to value creation, shifting to technology. We are the unquestionable world leader, and I think it is ours to lose. And so that's why technology is super critical and important. Mm -hmm. Back to the point around education, I think um, exporting education is um, not the best policy. I think everybody who graduates with an advanced four-year college degree in the US should have the option of having a green card stable to their diploma, right. uh, rather than having to go through this crazy student visa H-1B lottery system, which is fundamentally broken. Um, it is very, very backwards yeah. that we're bringing all these super smart, talented young kids, giving them the best education in the world, yeah. Yeah. and then shipping them off somewhere else to create yeah. new companies, become entrepreneurs, and create employment overseas. Yeah. But also on your earlier point around why um, Silicon Valley hasn't been effective in, uh, F in getting change around immigration reform. Um, Elon Musk was getting interviewed last week um, on stage, and an interviewer asked him, you've been criticized for participating in the Economic Council. Um, how, how do you respond to that criticism? He's like, 
I think it's really important to have a voice at the table. When it comes to my turn, I'm going to speak up, represent the company, represent immigrants like myself. It may or may not work, but at least I was present. But we've seen a lot of like, people taking, getting flack for even engaging with the current administration. Mm -hmm. That's not very healthy. They're at the table. They might not agree with the policies being put forward, but they're there when the conversation is being had. They're making their voices heard. Um, they shouldn't be getting tens of thousands of hate tweets in response yeah. towards, uh, towards representing uh, what they fundamentally believe is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. What, what is the most effective vehicle for, for that? Is it CEOs at the table? Is it some kind of alliance of, of people? Is it uh, old school lobbying? What, what's the right, I mean, the irony of course is that we have a self-styled CEO in the White House and it, there should be a common language with the CEOs of you know, the most valuable companies or the hottest startups. I mean, let's be honest, Trump's family are like second generation, third generation German immigrants. Elon Musk is a South African immigrant. Larry and Sergey, Sergey was a Russian immigrant. I mean, I cannot tell you the number of discussions we had where when we were discussing China and Sergey was bringing his perspective from Russia. And these things don't go away. I mean, they, like, they really mark you. And like when you were talking about your story and like even my story, I think I was deported at least twice and I was literally able to stay in the country by a hair when a certain regulation was changed. Otherwise, I was over my H-1B limit and I was gonna literally be put out of the country. So I still have dreams about like needing a visa to like go to tomorrow. So I do think we need to uh, transcend that. Uh, I think there was a joke, I'm married to a Canadian that like you don't realize how many of the movie actors, rock stars, comedians are Canadian, but because they have American <laughs> names, they're viewed as American. <laughs> Maybe we need to like celebrate and cherish those differences. Like I was just uh, hearing this crazy stat that before World War II, Germany had four times as many patents. After World War II, so many people immigrated to the U.S. that U.S. have uh, exceeded you know most of the other countries by far. It had four x more patents. Now probably China is catching up to us. So I think we just need to show people a different perspective. So that the agenda is not driven by this one. Immigration is bad, you know, people looking at, at it at, in a very kind of simplistically and missing all these other additional nuances. Mm. Do you think there are sectors within technology that are likely to be hit, hurt the most by the current climate, or is this a across the board kind of impact? I think it really depends a lot on what changes are going to be made. Right now, mm. it's still Nobody really knows. unknown, right? So they're talking about different things where if it's, uh, if it's just absolute dollar based, then it's of course going to hurt startups mm -hmm. versus large companies. If it's relative dollar based to what you have, you know, but again, I kind of go back to, look, I'm, a I'm just a venture capitalist. I yeah. used to be an engineer once. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know anything about politics other than what I read in the paper, but it seems that with this, um, I was fortunate to be at a CEO council recently and it does seem like having CEOs, because uh, it been other people, you know, the steel industry is getting yeah. what they want because they got to sit down, right? Yeah. Because Mario Draghi got to sit, you know. Yeah. So I think that uh, that might be a way. And I think moving the conversation to things that are around education and maybe educational visas in yeah. addition to educational retraining more broadly as yeah. Aiden brought up, like up leveling it, right? Making yeah. it about education, the immigration piece being in there. Because the reality is if you did get a green card stapled to your, you know, bachelor's or Master's, master's degree in computer science or engineering yeah. or anything, right, frankly, then you wouldn't need those people to get H-1Bs, exactly. right? Like, yeah. You would have been taken care of when you graduated. You wouldn't have needed your H-1B. And, and maybe one other and thing never to been add. Um, I mean, we have a very uh, high tech focus here, but maybe another thing we should do, I mean, because we're in California, so there are industries like farming, wineries, you look at the labor, all immigrants. Uh, you look at all the jobs people don't want to do, any type of support jobs of cleaning or gardening, whatever, everybody has an international name, they're all immigrants. You look at healthcare where there's a huge shortage, you go to a hospital, you look at people's name tags, I guarantee you like 60, 70% immigrant or you look at the name and clearly there is some like immigrant angle on it. I feel that we sometimes maybe are too divided and we need to unite. Hotel industry, I mean I was just checking out of my hotel this morning, the woman who was gonna like clean the room, whatever. I mean, you like, I immediately hear an accent. I'm like, wow. Like, I think like somebody was doing a documentary. Like, if all that immig all that immigrant labor force disappeared tomorrow, how would our lives be? And I think yeah. it would be greatly affected. And a lot of these people are afraid 
to raise their voice because some of them might be illegal or whatever and they're looking for a chance and they're just very, very afraid. And I think collectively, it actually represents a huge part of our industry and economy that maybe we're not seeing or we're ignoring, but it is not just tech. I think it touches other major sectors as well. Yeah. I was out in San Francisco a couple of days ago looking for a restaurant to get dinner at. Two of the three places I went to were closed for a day without immigrants. Oh, oh I see. Which was a great political statement. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, one of the, the genius of Silicon Valley is really in creating visions of a better future, whether it's finding information that was previously unfindable or being able to get a ride or a job. Uh, is there, um, you know, but a lot of the country right now feels that their future is not, their kids' future is not going to be better than their, than their own. And is there a role for Silicon Valley in kind of addressing this kind of crisis of confidence in the future? Is that, I mean, is that the sort of up-level I think it's our responsibility to, to think about how we can help impact that. And certainly there are ways in education, more broadly speaking, that we can. Yeah. Right. So a uh, couple, I, I mean, I know these are very little things, like probably little drops in the bucket of like the ocean of issues we're seeing, but uh, we're trying to back a lot more companies in cities that are not Silicon Valley, New York, and LA. We have portfolio companies, I think, in 10 US states, including places like Utah, Georgia. Uh, I'm gonna meet with a company later today in New Orleans. We saw a company out of Alabama. I think if those states, kind of like what happened with Snap in LA, if we have other role models and those people believe, like I always give this example when people ask me about Google, I'm like, look, after Chicago Bulls won the NBA title, how many people wanted to be like Jordan, right? So if we have like those successes in those cities and states, so they're not thinking about just German car co or Japanese car companies, but they're talking about, hey, we should be friendly policy to technology and it should transcend to all other states. I think that's a big thing. Um, we're trying to make a lot of investments and examples and uh, encourage that. Uh, we're trying to like invest in companies that can create jobs. The other thing is, um, this might be very unique and you might not think about it. We also have, I think, a duty to choose our LPs carefully. Like we don't have a lot of wealthy individuals or family offices, but we have a lot of endowments and they're not necessarily top endowments, which we have, but we have an endowment that is based in the southeast of the country that is the number four highest scholarships for you know, underprivileged children. Uh -huh. And I know that as venture capitalists, we like to you know, feel like we're changing the world. I'll be honest, I'm not changing the world, but we could do simple things that maybe put, you know, takes, uh, take some good steps in that goal of like moving to a better place. And hopefully those students that get those extra scholarships then, you know, will hopefully create new companies and yeah. create new jobs. So I'm gonna have to let that be the, the last word, but thank you very much to our panelists. Please thank them and find them after.